and broadside into her, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Linstock's ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. Sitting here in England, playing the country squire and getting soft in retirement, does at least serve to keep my memories sharp. And I retain a very clear picture in my mind of the events which followed the suppression of the mutiny and the flame. I was tired. I was much to do, many decisions to be taken. Certainly I felt little enough like granting an interview with a prisoner, and yet the seaman who bore Captain Freeman's message was awaiting my answer. Captain Freeman thinks it advisable he can send this fellow in to me. What's his name again? Le Brun, sir. He seems to be Deputy Mayor of Le Havre, sir. Deputy Mayor, is he? Hmm. Then let's see what he has to say. I've got him outside now, sir. Good. Bring him in. Come at all. See him now. Now, sir, what have you got to say to me? I take it, monsieur, that I may speak entirely in confidence. I promise nothing. I represent large commercial interests which have had great influence on the prosperity of the art. A firm which was prepared for the moment of peace with full warehouses could make millions. Millions. Look, I'm a busy man. Come to the point. His Majesty of Great Britain might do well to allow his friends to make those preparations in advance. Monsieur Lebrun, I trust you've given thought to what you're saying. They're words which would take you to the guillotine if Bonaparte ever heard of them. You're offering to betray the empire for commercial advantages. There are many in France, sir, who have no faith in the empire. Very well. You may tell me the nature of your offer, but remember that I can make no promises on behalf of my government. Well, suppose, for instance, that the city of Arf declared itself against the empire and for Louis XVIII. Well? It might be the example for which the empire is waiting. And if La Havre declared for the king... The city would be in alliance with Great Britain, and the license could then be granted for my firm to import. But how do I know that the city authorities will declare for the king? I can assure you of the support of the mayor, Monsieur Le Baron. Most of the other authorities would be safe, too. As to the others, a dozen well-timed arrests, an appeal to the troops in the barracks, the arrival of your forces, a heartening proclamation to the people, the declaration of a state of siege... And all would be over. Monsieur Lebrun, I've been very patient, but so far you've made no definite proposal. If you have one, make it. If not, allow me to proceed with my own duties. Very well, sir. Here is my proposal. Set me on shore. As an excuse, you could send me to arrange the exchange of prisoners. If I can assure Monsieur Le Baron of your support, I can complete the arrangements in three days. Three days. Meanwhile, you, sir, you remain close in the vicinity with all the force you can muster. The moment we secure the citadel, we shall send up a white flag. When you see that, sir, you will enter the harbor and overawe any resistance. In return for this, 
a license to import colonial produce and your word of honor that you will inform King Louis that it was I, Hercule Le Brun, who was responsible for the scheme. There, am I specific enough, sir? Uh, uh, there, sir. Pass the word for escort to take this prisoner away. I don't you refuse. But, sir... I will give you my decision in an hour. Meanwhile, for appearances' sake, you must be treated harshly. For the moment, I have no more to say. Bush, sir. Bush? By heavens, excellent. Well, of course, but Lew would send him, if possible. He, he knows I can always rely on Bush. Further signal, sir. Uh, also, Camilla, 36, Captain Howard. Have on board 300 Marines. 300 Marines? That's wonderful, sir. With those and our own men and the none such, we shall be able to march 500 men into La Havre if the opportunity arises. Flag the tenor, make the signal. Commodore to all vessels. Join me here after dark. All right, sir. I shall transfer to the flame. Mr. Freeman, there'll be other work for you with the porter trailing. Kindly join me with Captains Bush and Howard when they arrive after dark. Lebrun must be completing his plans, and we must strike tomorrow, if at all. Aye, aye, sir. good it was to see Bush again as he hoisted himself and his wooden leg onto the flame in the darkness. It was good, too, to sit in the stuffy little cabin with Bush, Freeman, and Howard and outline my plans for the morrow. Action was what I needed, and the prospect of it swept away all my doubts and fears. I knew there was no certainty that my government wanted to restore the Bourbons if Bonaparte fell, that they might refuse to honor my promise of the import license, uh, they might refuse to recognize Louis the Eighteenth, But I might be sharply reprimanded for all I'd done. But the time for hesitation was over now, and the risk must be taken. I saw Bush studying me anxiously. You've been very busy since you came to sea again, sir. Too busy, if you'll pardon me. Huh? It was too soon for you to resume duty. Nonsense, Bush. I've had nearly a year's sick leave. Yes, sir. Sick leave. After typhus. Uh, since then, you... Since know. then, endless work, cutting out action, a battle, three prizes taken, two vessels sunk, an invasion planned, and now, a midnight council of war. Now, look here, are you gentlemen trying to tell me that I'm unfit for service? Well, no, sir, but I... Well, uh, then kindly keep your opinions to yourselves. Now, <clears throat> you all understand what I want done tomorrow. If tomorrow is the day... Mm -hmm. No questions? No, no, no. Well, you... You must forgive me if I was rude just now. Had a trying day. Beat to quarters and clear the brig for action. Uh, hand me that speaking trumpet. Thank you. Porter Taylor, ahoy! Lame, ahoy! Are you cleared for action? All ships clear, sir. Then keep stations as ordered. Aye, aye, sir. Now remember, Mr. Crawley, if I'm killed as we go in, the flame is to be laid alongside the key. Captain Bush is to be informed as soon as possible, but the flame is to go on. And now let's get those men moving. This cold will chill them into numbness. Men, you with the guns and sheets, let's see how you can jump. Go on, lively now. Move your arms as well. Go on, like this. Huh? Huh? Up. Thank you. Uh, yes, and you can 
take that grin off your face, Brian. All right, sir. <laughs> this will be another legend in the Navy, sir, about how you went into action with the men jumping. Yeah. Remember the time, sir, when you had the men dancing the old pipe as we went into action against the Nativity, Dad? No desire to recall the past at the moment, Brian. Future will keep us busy enough. Mr. Crawley, two uh, hands at the lead, if you please. If one is killed, the other is to continue sounding. All right, sir. On the other tack. Uh-huh. On the other tack. Uh-huh. Head uh-huh. sheets. Uh-huh. Mainsail sheets. Uh-huh. Making three knots under four and a half sail, we stood in for the hard. Shadowy in the fog, I could just make out Porter Chaley following our tack. Behind her, but invisible to me, was the old nun such. I had not set eyes on her since the day I quitted her to catch the typhus in Riga. Ah, good old Bush. It was comforting to have him with me again with his stolid loyalty and the nun such as thundering broadside. And an anchored boy loomed on the starboard bow. We were nearing the entrance to the harbor. shot is to be fired without my orders. A man who fires a gun, no matter for what reason, unless I tell him to, I'll not merely flog, I will hang. Before sunset today, he'll be at the yard arm. You hear me? Aye, aye, aye. soon know if this is a trap or not. But if LeBron is playing a double game, only the flame will be lost. The others will get clear and heaven help LeBron and his city. Look. Bear along that key as quick as you can now. Where is your officer? Ah, are, are you in command here, sir? Oh, what do you want? Well, tell your men not to fire. Have you not received your new orders? Well, get your men away from those guns before there's an accident. Go on. Sir, look down there. British ships at the key. British marines for me. What am I to do? Send the messenger at once to the other battery to make sure the officer in command understands. But, but monsieur, I cannot. I, I... I said at once, sir. The moment was tense and uncertain. The young officer was clearly undecided. And then I had an inspiration. I'd been speaking in French, of course. And now I heard the rhythmic tread of a section of Marines approaching, and I beckoned them to march past me. As they approached, I called to them. I left! The men's heads turned smartly towards the French officer. The officer of Marines saluted smartly, and the courtesy of it completely took the wind out of the Frenchman's sails. As he gaped, the Marines wheeled left round the battery, in through the open sally port, in among the guns, pushing the gunners aside, knocking the smoldering linstocks from their hands. Uh, let me help you up. All right, sir, I can manage, I can manage. Uh, I shall write to the other batteries. See that the other landing parties deploy as arranged. for heating shot. Never have stormed this battery by ordinary methods. Parapets five feet thick and eight feet high. Ten foot ditches. Sir, pardon, monsieur. I do not understand. Who are you and why did you say b- b- king? Ah, uh, are you the subaltern in charge here? Yes, monsieur. Sir, I, I bring you great news. 
This is the beginning of a new age for France. Ah, ah Mr. Howard, you found a horse too. Is all well? As far as I know, sir. I thought I ought not to involve a landing party in the narrow streets of the town without orders. Uh, I have two midshipmen here if you need messengers, sir. Oh, um, and your coxswain. Uh, your hat, sir. I picked it up on the key. Oh, well, thank you, Brian. The harbor defenses are all secured, Mr. Howard. Yes, sir, thanks to your boldness. It looks as if that chap Lebrun has at least succeeded in creating some confusion. None of these frogs seem to know what to do. Yeah, we mustn't give them time to think. Hello? Who comes here? A rider with a white handkerchief in his hand? You are uh, Monsieur Hornblower, sir? Hornblower, yes. Well, I come from Monsieur Le Baron, sir. Uh -huh. The citadel is secure. He is about to descend into the main square. Good. <laughs> in gay procession, the people stared at us. Some curious or sullen, some indifferent, but none actively hostile. In the Place de l'Hôtel de Ville, there was far more bustle than life. Numerous men sat horses, a detachment of gendarmes drawn up in line, gave an air of respectability to the proceedings. But what really caught the eye was the multitude of white emblems. White was everywhere. Sir, they're making sure we understand there's a truce on. Look at all them bed sheets hanging out the windows. Oh, even the police have got white cockades in their hats. They're not truce colours, right? White is the colour of the Bourbons, the kings of France. Oh, so this is the first time for 20 years that the Bourbon white has shown on French soil. Oh, here comes a fat looking bloke with a white sash. Ah, I bet he had a tricolour there yesterday. Mm. He, he looks an important sort of coat, sir. Yes, I suspect he's the mayor, Baron Momas. Come on, in. Oh! Yes. Uh, hold my horse while I dismount, will you? Our friend, our ally, Sir Honor Blower, I embrace you. Uh, silence! Silence! This gentleman is to be respected. Ah, and uh, here is Monsieur Lebrun, I perceive. Your servant, sir. Our plan has exceeded order. Count order. This. Oh, this no, is no, a no. great moment, Sir Hornblower. A very great moment, Monsieur LeBaron. If you will be so good as to accompany me to the foot of the flagstaff, the ceremony is about to begin. I shall proclaim allegiance to His Majesty. Certainly, sir. After you. The citizens of Le Havre, I, Baron Momas, mayor of the city, declare that all true Frenchmen no longer serve the new Zephyr, Napoleon Bonaparte. Brian, what's happening? Oh, yes, sir. Um, there seems to be a fight down that side street. And it is someone before you on the battle. They are resisting. <laughs> Into this building, sir. On go quickly. They will soon be dealt with. Uh, gendarmerie, gendarmerie, do your duty. In this way, sir, on go. We shall be safe here. Yes, I'm, I'm an officer, not an alderman. My horse! Here, yeah, quickly. numbered only some 30 or 40 men and could have been dealt with by the police, but it was important in this early stage of the town to be given a lead. The slightest hesitation or show of leniency might lose the town. They scattered before our charge. I reformed my men and marched them back to the square where the mayor had once again taken up his stand beneath the flagstaff. The citizens of the harbor... I declare that all true Frenchmen voluntarily recognize the unbroken reign of his most Christian majesty, Louis XVIII, King of France and of all. One of the Bourbons had that. Yes, I think, Brian, it's time for a gesture on our part. And three cheers for the king. Now, all together now. Hip, hip, hip. Oh, 
What blooming king are we hollering for? Oh, I don't know. Warney says we got to cheer. And if Warney told me to cheer old Boney himself, I'd do it, see? The port of Le Havre was ours. Bonaparte had suffered his greatest defeat yet since Moscow. It was perhaps only a foothold, but English feet held it. And after all these years, all the blood and the heartache, the ground seemed to shake beneath the tyrant Bonaparte's feet. <laughs> Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.